So we are very proud as a society, the Luxembourg Society for Microbiology, to have uh, Professor Xavier de Bol today with us. Um, and uh, he is actually the, um, the professor at the University of um, uh, Namur in the position of the research unit of microorganisms biology and where the main focus on molecular biology and his research fields include uh, investigation of molecular mechanisms of growth, replication and cell cycle control, and especially for the Bursella abortis pathogen. But on the other side, also Xavier de Bol is a member of the board of directors of the Belgian Society for Microbiology. And um, he's a, um, a reviewer of many international uh, journals and also in the editor's uh, field. Um, I have to say also, I'm very delighted personally to have uh, um, Xavier de Bol today with us because 16 years ago, I was one of his university students and I was always impressed by his high level uh, and innovative teaching methods where he, he understood that it actually very early to, that it was important to link microbiology also with this application. So like for the industrial or the practical applications and also to make the university students discover this. So for this, it, um, uh, it, it was very innovative at that moment. It was already some years ago. And um, uh, we, in the meantime, a lot has evolved, of course, uh, at the University of Namur. They also initiated under the role of responsibility of Xavier de Bol and some colleagues, also a new master thesis, which is called the 3M. And the 3M stands for a Master in Molecular Microbiology, and it has a special focus on research. And this research is always close also uh, to, to the education and to the teaching that Xavier de Bol gives at the University of Namur. And um, so this um, um, presentation is also uh, the research that he, sorry, the research that he's giving in his, um, his lab is mainly focused on Brucella uh, abortis, and we will have the presentation today. His lab has greatly evolved. So there are, uh, until now, 32 master theses were completed, 18 PhD theses were presented, and three are currently ongoing. Um, many different uh, publications since then. And also, um, there is a, a lot of uh, research going on for the moment. Uh, he was also awarded the prize of uh, Namurua de l'été. So it's the citizen of, uh, of the year of Namur, where he was elected. And there he got really known by uh, also the broad public of Namur. But until then, he was already internationally and nationally, of course, known in the society for, for well, in, in microbiology in general, and especially also by the European uh, and Lux National Society of Microbiology. So um, I'm very proud uh, in the name of the LSFM um, to have Xavier de Bol today with us. And we are curious and happy to listen now to his presentation. Thanks a lot, and, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Xavier. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. <clears throat> Wonderful introduction. I'm sorry. But uh, I hope that you will enjoy the presentation. Uh, so thank you first for the invitation. It's the first time for me that I'm making a conference uh, like this uh, from uh, my desk, let's say. And so, um, I like discussion and questions, so please, in the end, do not hesitate to uh, to ask as many questions as you want. So, uh, as Connie said, uh, our main focus is a wonderful bacterium, a surprising bacterium. It's called Brucella abornis, and you see here a picture that was taken by Creo EM, Creo electron microscopy. It was done in Brussels in the lab of Anne Robert. And you see that it has a, a, an envelope. Uh, you see the two membranes of the bacterium. And you can guess that there is a thin layer here. It's probably a peptidoglycan. -like. And you will see uh, during the presentation, we are more and more interested by, uh, by, this, uh, by this envelope. But first, I would like to develop a little bit what is known about brucellosis. Uh, indeed, brucellosis abortus is the agent responsible for brucellosis, and brucellosis is a zoonosis. It means that it infects uh, animals, 
and uh, the, the disease can be transmitted from animals to humans. But there is no transmission between humans, meaning that uh, you cannot have a, a pandemic like the one we have now um, with, uh, with COVID. But uh, nevertheless, it's a, it's a huge problem for uh, agriculture and for trading of animals, for example, between uh, countries. So the infection cycle of uh, this bacterium uh, starts with injection, uh, ingestion sorry, of, the, of the bacteria, and I will come back to how it can happen. And the first step of the, of the entry of the bacterium inside the host is not well known. But we know that from any other animal models, like mice, that uh, the bacteria are quickly found inside host cells. They are quickly intracellular. And using the cells of the host, the bacterium can travel into the body of its host. And it can spread uh, through the lymphatic and the bloodstream. And it can reach genital organs. And there you can have uh, inflammation and transmission. You can have orchitis in males. And in pregnant females, you have uh, infection of the placenta. I will show you a picture of an infected placenta in a minute. And uh, from the placenta, they can uh, generate abortion. And abortion uh, uh, will generate a very high amount of bacteria. There is about 10 to the 12 bacteria per gram of uh, tissue that is uh, generated by abortion. And the infection dose is about 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, meaning that there is a, a lot of opportunity for the bacterium to infect uh, other hosts in the same herd. The, from the placenta, it can also reach um, the mammary gland, and there is also excretion of the bacterium in the milk. And then you, 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 you finish the, the, the cycle, as you see. So these bacteria are class three pathogens. It means that you have to uh, manipulate them in a biosafety level three uh, lab. And uh, the reason is that uh, there is no vaccine currently for humans. The vaccines that are available for the animals uh, have a lot of problems. And if you as human, you are infected, the treatment you have to follow is quite long and it's quite painful. And the reason the treatment is so uh, long and uh, so painful is that you have to take a lot of antibiotics to reach the bacteria that are actually inside uh, host cells. Indeed, Brucella is an intracellular pathogen. And here you have a, a picture of um, a fragment of the, the placenta, these cells that you see here are uh, chorionic trophoblasts. I've surrounded one in, a, in a red here. And you see here that there's a nucleus in this cell and around most of the black dots that you see there are proliferating bacteria. So this is a, a goat that has been infected uh, with uh, Brucella arboreus. And you see that the bacterium is massively proliferating in many of these uh, chorionic uh, trophoblasts. And if you go deeper in the resolution, you, you will actually see that there are connections between the vacuoles in which you find bacteria. You see one here, one there, one there. And you see that in this vacuole, you have a continuum with the rough ontoplasmic reticulum. Right, and actually, when the bacteria are replicating uh, in the host cells, they are replicating in compartments that have markers of the of the ER of the endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, you can reproduce this observation if you infect cells in culture. So you can infect many different types of cells, like macrophages, virus cells, HeLa cells, and with cells in culture you can follow the traffic of the bacterium inside the host cell. So the bacteria, they, go, they enter by something like the, something that looks like macropinocytosis, phagocytosis, depends on the cells. It acquires markers of the endosomes, 
like the lamp one, such a marker of late endosomes, and it will, the bacterium will stay in these vacuoles for many, many hours. And after a long period, they produce a type four secretion system. So it's a secretion system that can secrete uh, DNA and proteins. And we think that the proteins that are secreted by this secretion system, or so-called VIB, the, these protein factors, they allow the trafficking of the bacterium to the ER. And when the bacterium is replicating in the ER, there is no labeling with LAMP1, the marker of late endosomes, but you have labeling with markers that are typical of the ER. And you see here the bacteria that are labeled with an antibody, itself coupled to a bead, to gold beads. And you see that again, where the bacterium is, there is a vacuole, and there's a continuum of this vacuole with the, with the ER. Okay, so we can reproduce the infection with cells in culture in laboratory, and it seems that the replication niche is roughly the same. And that's interesting because it makes your life easier as a researcher. So the, when you work on a, on a bacterium, it, like any organism in biology, the first thing you have to consider is evolution. And you know evolution is extremely important in biology. And if you look at the phylogenetic analysis of Brucella, you see that they are part of an order, it's called the rhizobials. So maybe you don't know the rhizobials, but they are very famous in the microbiology society. Indeed, because you find in these uh, rhizobials, bacteria like Sana rhizobium, Lilota, Liloti. And this bacterium is very famous because it makes symbiotic interactions with plants. It allows the fixation of uh, atmospheric nitrogen. Another famous bacterium is Agrobacterium tumefaciens. It is in these bacteria that we uh, discovered that DNA could be transferred between bacteria and plants. And Agrobacterium is actually a pathogen of uh, plants. So these bacteria, they have things in common. The first thing I would like to cite is that they are polarized, meaning that the bacterium, they look like this. So they are very small, 1.5 micrometer long, and they have two poles. So you see one pole on one side, and no, you can see us. Yes. Um, you have one pole on one side and one pole of, on the other side. And actually, uh, in my lab and many of the labs uh, in the community, in the rhizobians, we discovered that there are proteins that are specifically localized to one pole or the other. Here we took two proteins, PDHS, I will mention it later, we fuse it to a yellow fluorescent protein and pops it to, the, to a red fluorescent protein. And you see that these proteins localize at opposite poles in the, in the bacterial cell. And so the poles have specialized function in the, still continue to investigate that at the moment. We will see later that actually one pole will be called the old pole and the other pole will be called the new pole. And this is due to a, to a particular property that this bacteria has, this unipolar growth, and I will develop to, with you what is unipolar growth with this bacteria. They have a long chain um, lipid A, we'll come back to that briefly also. They have a, a very conserved um, cell cycle regulator called CTRA, and I will develop that also. And finally, they also have chromids. So what are chromids? Chromids are kind of hybrids between plasmids and chromosome. And the name chromid from, comes from chromosome plasmid, which is together, chromid. So Brussels arborius, it has two chromosomes. It has, let's say, a regular chromosome, or chromosome one. It has a partition system. So when the, the chromosome is replicating, the origin is segregated. Thanks to this power B system, I will come back to this system in a minute. And they have another system for the second chromosome, for the chromid. This is called the RAP system. And many rhizobials have chromid uh, with a RAP AB uh, system following their segregation. 
So uh, in my lab, we had a, a great uh, PhD student, uh, Michael de Gelt, Mike. So what Mike did is that he wanted to follow the origin of replication of the chromosomes of Brussels. So what he did is that he genetically engineered the region containing the PAR AB uh, genes. So what he did is that he duplicated the PAR B gene and he fused a fluorescent protein called M cherry to PAR B. And PAR B was known to bind to sites in, on the DNA close to the replication origin that are called PAR S. And what we've seen is that actually these fusions are produced. The fusion protein that is shown here in red and orange is binding actually to the PAR S sequences. And what you get is a bacteria that have uh, spots inside the, the bacterial cell. And you can localize actually the replication origin of your chromosome thanks to this, to this system. And you see here that most of the time when we have one single spot, it is at one pole of the cell. And in the rest of the population, you have two spots. Often these two spots are at opposite poles. And sometimes, I'm sorry, sometimes you see that this one of two spots is migrating actually in the cell. So what happens is that this region is duplicated. So PAR B, I'm sure, binds to the two replication origins. And the two origins we segregate along the, the, the body of the cell, let's say. And uh, it will position the replication origins at uh, both poles of the of the bacteria. So it did that for chromosome one, but it did that also for chromosome two. So for the red A B system, it was another protein of another color called YFP, and then we could follow the replication origin of the two chromosomes. And we discovered, for example, that the replication origin of the first chromosome is duplicated, duplicated first compared to the second chromosome. So there is an order. And this is something we learned throughout all the study we do here on the molecular biology of Brussels, is that everything is very well ordered in the, in the cell. So we use these tools to uh, ask whether the cell cycle of uh, Brussels is affected during an infection. So we infect it again, ILA cells, uh, as the cells we, we uh, described before, with bacteria, Brussels bodies, that constitutively produce GFP, so you can detect them in, a, in infected cells. That's, a, that's an infected cells at only six hours post-infection. Here is the nucleus, and here you see the bacteria, the bacterium, and you see you can, you can detect it thanks to GFP. And we localized PAR B in this tree. And what we saw was very interesting. Actually, we saw that more than 75% of the bacteria, they have only one replication origin in these conditions. While in culture, just before the infection, we have about 20, 25% of the bacteria at that stage of the cell cycle. So this showed two things. First, the bacteria that have only one replication origin, they go in more easily than other uh, bacteria in ILA cells. And actually, they stay blocked for a long time at this stage of the cell cycle. And when replication is starting, what you see here on the right, you see that many bacteria have two spots of PAMI showing that they are indeed growing and replicating their, their chromosome. And so the proportion of bacteria with only one spot, let's say, of PAMI is going down, which is logical, but you is replicating. So you have a lot of bacteria that are in the, what we call the S phase of the cell cycle. So, so they leave the G1 phase where they don't replicate to the stage where they replicate and segregate the replication origins. So this and many other data actually allowed us to, to propose a model in which the, the bacteria, they come inside those cells as early as 15 minutes post-infection, we've been able to detect that uh, 
the origin of replications are not duplicated and segregated, they remain in G1 actually for a very long time, several hours. This is what we call the G1 block. And you will see later, this G1 block is something really common in, uh, in, um, in bacteria, at least the, the type of bacteria we are working on. And after, after eight, 10 hours post-infection, there is massive proliferation probably in the ER. And then you realize that cell cycle must be controlled. But how? How is it controlled? Here, again, you can come back to uh, phylogeny and evolution. And if you do that with Brusella, Brusella militancies is vacuum very close to Brusella borders, you will see that here are the rhizobiales, and we are not far from a, a Colobacter crescentus, which is actually the model bacterium for alpha proteobacteria. Indeed, the rhizobiales, they belong to alpha proteobacteria, and we are very lucky that in that group, there is this famous model, Colobacter crescentus, which is a, a model to study cell cycle and differentiation. Why? Because it has a cell cycle that is very uh, interesting and easy to follow, actually. This cell cycle starts with bacteria that are swimming. So these bacteria, Colobacter, they live in rivers, in ponds, and so on. So they are free living bacteria. Usually, they live uh, in the rivers. And what they do, if they find uh, um, food, they will differentiate. They will lose their ability to swim thanks to the flagellum they have here. They will stick to a surface. And they will stick really strongly to the surface thanks to a structure that we call the old fast. It's made of uh, polysaccharide, it's made of DNA, it's extremely sticky. You can stick uh, an elephant to, to the roof with a, a, a point like a two euro of, of glue, uh, of the old fast glue. So it's very sticky. And between this uh, old fast and the, the cell body, the bacterium will grow a stalk. And the stalk gets longer and longer when the the bacteria uh, is becoming old. So the bacterium will grow. It will make a flagellum at the opposite pole of the stalk, and it will divide here, more or less in the middle. And then you will generate two cells that are completely different. One is sticking to a surface that is available, for example, a rock at the bottom of the river. And the other one is a swimming bacterium. So this bacterium will swim, and we tested that in the lab. They can swim for many hours. If they don't find food, they swim. The other bacterium here, it's obliged to stay where it is, but it is able to restart the S phase very quickly if food is available. So this bacterium has been under study for, by many different laboratories. First, the laboratory of uh, Lucy Shapiro at Stanford, and then also many laboratories uh, in Europe and uh, in the USA. And they described a very complex regulation network, and I will not go into the details of that, that network. Uh, just I want to, to mention that uh, in this network, you have a very famous player that is C-theory. C-theory is a it's a transcriptional regulator. It is controlled by phosphorylation, and it is controlled at the transcriptional level, and it is controlled by proteolysis. It's a very important uh, player. And what we found is that by comparing the genomes, we found that actually the, um, the, the most of these proteins that are, they are actually conserved in uh, Brusella arborvis. We even have uh, additional players. For example, we found a protein that is homologue to DIFJ and PC. We call it PC DIFJ homologue sensor because it's homologous to uh, sensor proteins. Right, so uh, we have been interested by C theory in uh, Brusella arborvis since many, many years. And one student in the lab, uh, Naila Francis, she constructed a strain where 
she deletes the CTR gene, which is an essential gene. So you cannot leave, Bristol uh, laboratories cannot leave with, uh, without CTR. But we added CTR on the plasmid, and we can control uh, the lac promoter thanks to IPTG. So those that are working in the field of microbiology certainly know what it is. So it's an, an kind of uh, inducer that we can use to switch on the promoter, the lac promoter of E. coli that we fused to the Bruxelles Arbortus C. theory. And we can cultivate the bacterium in the presence of IPTG, but when Naila was removing IPTG from the culture, you see that after some hours, you lose, here yeah, it's the Western blood, you lose the, the band corresponding to C. theory. And what happens to the morphology? You see here that along the time, in the absence of IPTG, what you see is bacteria continue to grow, but they forget to divide. So what this uh, tells us is that Brucella is um, C theory is necessary to uh, promote the division of the of the bacteria, at least in the Brucella amboris. So now. We were wondering, okay, that's a phenotype we have for C-theory, but what are the targets of C-theory? So we did a chip seek experiment and we found about 100 direct targets for C-theory. And among them, we found uh, um, genes involved in uh, DNTP synthesis, initiation of replication, methylation of DNA, positioning of the division site, the, the, the divisions, the cell division itself, the segregation of terminator region of chromosomes, etc. So you, you see there a lot of um, target in the cell division process. So it seems that C theory is a transcriptional factor that is there to push expression of cell division genes to be sure, let's say, that uh, all these proteins are present at the right time during. Uh, cell division, which is kind of dangerous process. You will uh, uh, cut the cell in two pieces for a bacterium. This could be a kind of trauma, you know. So you need to be sure that all the proteins are there at the right time, at the right place as well. But we also found that C theory is controlling a lot of components of the envelope. Indeed, it con seems to control directly the LPA synthesis the export of LPS to the oral membrane, a lot of these major oral membrane proteins, we call OMPs, oral membrane proteins, and even proteins that incorporate uh, other proteins into the oral membrane. OM means oral membrane, as well as hypoproteins. So we tried to uh, investigate that. So we uh, took a strain in which we can control CTRA with IPTG, and we made a Western blood to quantify some of these uh, proteins. And we found that one of them, when pin 25, you find less that protein when you uh, cultivate your bacteria in the absence of IPTG, while others remain really, really stable. And you see here the control with CTRA, you have less protein, is logical because you removed IPTG. And then because we had uh, antibodies against uh, OMP25, thanks to uh, the work done by uh, Jean-Jacques Tesson, uh, my uh, friend and uh, supervisor and uh, colleague for many years. So he developed uh, monoclonal antibodies against uh, many of these oral membrane proteins. And what we found is that the, the bacteria, you see the strange shape they have, they forget to divide these bacteria, so they make a kind of branching. And you see that the proteins, OMP25, they are, not, they are no longer found everywhere on the surface, meaning that at some point they have not been produced. But you see that when they are produced, they are produced at similar sites, both ends of the cells. Um, it's also visible here and there and there. So this was a very interesting observation. Why? First, because it tells you that when you produce OMP25 in one pole of the cell, you produce also to the other pole, but not everywhere on the surface. It seems that the material of the oral membrane is 
coordinately inserted in the, in the envelope. And the second thing interesting is that it seems that the OMP25 there, it can't move. If the membrane was fluid, you expect to find OMP25 uh, almost everywhere, and it's not the case. And actually, it's time now to describe what this unit goes because these y shaped forms, morphologies, they are typical of cell division defect in bacteria that have, that have unipolar growth. And so to explain what is unipolar growth, I will start to describe what is lateral growth in a bacterium like E. coli. So this is the classical model, E. coli, and it's growing by lateral growth. What does it mean? You take a bacterium like E. coli, you can label the surface thanks to a molecule that binds to a mine group on the surface, and it is coupled to Texas red. So your bacteria are red. And if you let them grow, you will see that the signal, the red signal, is diluted with time. The pores remains labeled, but the, the lateral side of the bacterium, uh, the, the red fluorochrome is diluted. If you do the same experiment with agrobacterium, with brucella, with rhizobium, what you will see is completely different. You label the bacteria, and then you see that they are, they are red. And actually, when they grow, the, the unlabeled material is only incorporated at one pole. And that's the pole we call the new pole. Sometimes we call it also the growing pole. And the other pole that doesn't grow, this is the, the old pole. And here you see bacteria that have been uh, analyzed by the Charles van der Enst, another PhD student in the lab. They label, he labeled the bacteria with Texas red on the, on the surface. And you see this bacterium, for example, it is generating unlabeled material only on one side. And this bacterium will start growing again, making a new bacterium again at the, the, the new pole. And this is very intriguing. And we really wonder what is exactly incorporated at these uh, growing sites. And we started with um, the peptidoglycan. And that's the work of uh, Vicky Vassen, German students that worked uh, in the lab for, for four years for her PhD. And what she did, among many different things we we'll see, she incorporated fluorescent D amino acids. Uh, on growing uh, brucella. So what are these D amino acids? You probably remember from your courses that uh, in the peptidoglycan, you have D amino acids. And there are enzymes called DD transpeptidases and other enzymes called LD transpeptidases that can actually incorporate these uh, D amino acids into the peptidoglycan. And it was published many years ago that if you do that with agrobacterium, which is rhizobium, so it has unipolar growth, what you will see is that take this bacterium, for example, you will see that the blue labeling corresponding to this fluorochrome here is inserted only at the growth side. And it is also inserted is in this dividing bacterium, is also inserted at the division side. So, these, uh, this labeling, which is very easy, it's five minute incubation, huh? and that's, that's it. Uh, you can monitor where is the immature peptidoglycan. That's what we did with Brucella. We labeled the, first the bacteria with a fluorochrome, M3 fused, genetically fused to a PDHS, a protein. This is always in the whole pole. And um, you see that the HAD labeling, the D amino acid labeling, is at the opposite pole. When the bacteria are dividing, so this bacterium is dividing, it's obvious, you see that the, the blue labeling, so the D amino acid labeling, is concentrated in the, at the division site. And in bacteria that are about to divide, we have labeling at both sides, the growing pole and the division. All right, then after we uh, decided to analyze a lot of bacteria and to use PDHS as an anchor to detect 
where was the old pool? And we used a, a fantastic program that has been uh, developed by uh, Adrien Ducre when he was in the lab of Yves Brun in uh, Indiana University. And this program is great because it allows you to order, for example, the bacteria according to, to the size, so the small bacteria are on the left, the big bacteria on the right, and you can orient them asking the program to put the old pole at the bottom here in the graph. And we call that, they call that a demograph. And here, when it is very uh, bright here, it means that you have a lot of fluorescence. When it's dark blue, it means you have low fluorescence. And you see that when the bacterium is growing, you have a labeling at the new pole, the opposite to the old pole, labeling at the new pole. At some point, you have delocalization or relocalization of the fluorescence to the mid cell. And in the end, you have a labeling only at the mid cell. So that's great. That's uh, completely consistent with what is found in uh, agrobacteria. But to, what do we know about all the membrane components? So we, we decided to look at lipopolysaccharide, LPS, or all the membrane uh, proteins. And we will start with LPS insertion sites. So to monitor the LPS insertion sites, uh, we used uh, a genetic trick. Actually, we know that the LPS is composed of three parts, as you probably, re probably remember from your microbiology courses. So the LPS is composed of lipid A, the core, and the O chain. And in Brussels, this O chain is made of uh, n formyl perosamine, which is a derivative of mannose, shown in, uh, in green. And um, this uh, n formula uh, perosamine is made from GDP mannose. And GDP mannose allows the mannose to be incorporated into the core. You see there is one mannose there. And it allows also the synthesis of the, of the OG. And in the lab, we have monoclonal antibodies against the old chain of Brucella. About these maps, monoclonal antibodies are called 4 f 9 12 f 12 It's not really important here. So what Vicky uh, did in the lab is that she constructed a mutant in the GMD gene. And this, you can still make GDP manos, but you cannot make O-chain, uh, you cannot make uh, O-chain anymore. So you can make GDP manos, you can incorporate into the core, but you will make only rough LPS, no more uh, smooth LPS. So we made a quite a complex experiment. So we'll try to drive you into that experiment. So what we did, we took a strain that has a PDHS and Sherry, so a labeling in the old pole. And we labeled the bacteria with uh, not Texas rest this time, but e fluorop it's the same chemistry. So it's just a different fluorochrome in the far red. And then we let the bacteria grow for some hours. And what is done? We label the OGE. Remember, I showed you we had antibodies. We have antibodies allowing the labeling of the OGE. And if you do that, you can see bacteria here in phase contrast. They have one pole labeled with PDHS and Sherry. They have uh, labeling with if you are for only a fraction of the cell because you had unipolar growth. In this time, you have unipolar growth. And you see that after growth, you have O chain of the LPS everywhere on the bacterial cell. This is completely logical. Now, if you take a mutant that cannot make O chain anymore, then you have everything labeled the same, except for the smooth LPS, the O chain labeling, for which you have nothing. Logical, you cannot make. O chain anymore. So then, what we did is that we inserted in that strain, Delta GMD, we inserted again the GMD gene, but under the control of a lac promoter again. And as I already told you, this promoter you can control it with IPTG. So we grew the bacteria without IPTG, then GMD is not expressed, 
at least not enough, and you don't have labeling of the OG. But then, if during this growth time, you add uh, IPTG, what happens is that you generate three different types of, let's say, phenotypes. The first is this one. You see that you have incorporation of O-chain, and this incorporation of O-chain occurs only at the new pore. In dividing bacteria, you have a labeling at the division site, and in bacteria that are almost ready to divide, you see that you have incorporation of smooth LPS at both sides, which is very interesting because it means that not only uh, component labeled by if you are or Texas cannot move on the surface, but also LPS is really restrained to some area, doesn't move easily. To give more strength to this uh, hypothesis, we tested it uh, during another experiment in which we use click chemistry. So we meet uh, Boris Vosey from Paris that gave us a compound called KDON3. And KDO, we come back to uh, the structure of LPS, KDO is actually this sugar. And this KDO is actually a part of the, of the LPS. And this KDO is very special because it has a N3 group, an acido group here at the very last carbon of the, of the structure. So with what we did, we took bacteria, we labeled them with ifluor, and this is what you get here by labeling with ifluor. We still have the PDGS and cherry labeling, it's not very important here. And you see that at first the bacteria are completely labeled. And then we grow them in the presence of KDO N3. And what we hope is that KDO N3 will enter the bacteria, will be incorporated in the synthesis of LPS, and will be presented on the surface of the bacteria. So we hope to have a side group on the surface. And then we use a cyclooctin fused to a fluorescent molecule, which is green here. And this cyclooctin, it has a triple bond here, able to react with the acid groups. And it should allow labeling of the N3 coupled to KDO on the surface. And what we saw, shown here and there, is that actually the, the part of the bacterium that grew, that are not labeled with EFRIOR, this part is labeled in green. And this shows that LPS can indeed be inserted at this, at this place and be recognized by this uh, fluorochrome there. And if you uh, try to localize the EFRIOR and the KDO entry, you have an almost perfect um, opposite labeling of the two um, of the two labelings, meaning that the KDUN3 is inserted into new LPS. Right, I see that my time is almost uh, in, uh, <laughs> done, so I will I will skip this. Just I'll tell you a little bit about what we found very recently. I told you that there are two proteins called OMP25 and OMP2B. Uh, OMP2B, I didn't describe a lot. It's a porin, it's a, the major porin actually of uh, Brucella aborgis. And if you label these proteins on the surface of the bacteria, what you see is that they don't move. And one hypothesis we had to explain why they don't move on the surface is that they could be bound to the what we call the most obvious micromolecules that doesn't move in the periplasm. And this macromolecule is peptidoglycan, of course. So um, to know which proteins could be bound to uh, peptidoglycan, we made a mass spec. But first, I would like to describe in a few words what is known about the binding of the oral membrane to the peptidoglycan in the modern bacterium, which is E. coli. In E. coli, there is a protein formed by Braun uh, more than 50 years ago. It's a lipoprotein. It has a C-terminal lysine that allows that is directly bound to the mesodap uh, amino acid of the 
peptidoglycan. So this is peptidoglycan. You have glycan chains, you have peptides. These peptides can be connected, but sometimes these peptides they are connected, covalently bound to this uh, protein, the, what we call the brown lipoprotein or LPP. So it's possible to have covalent connections between the oral membrane and the peptidoglycan through proteins. And we have no homologs for LPP in Brussels laboratories. So what Pierre did in the lab some years ago, two, two years ago, two, three years ago, is that he prepared envelope of Brussels laboratories. He treated them with SDS, very high temperature, and he recovered peptidoglycan with bound proteins. And he made mass spec analysis. And he found uh, a short list of all the membrane proteins that are seems to be tightly bound to peptidoglycan. And when he analyzed um, the link of the protein to the peptidoglycan, what he found is that by sequencing the end terminus of the proteins, here it's MP25, uh, when you sequence the end terminus of MP25, this is the last amino acid, and the next amino acid is mesodap. And then uh, glutamate and LA. And this shows that this protein is bound to the peptide stem of the peptidoglycan. And that was true also for MP2B. It was true also for other, other membrane uh, proteins. So our model is the following is that this protein, they actually have N terminal extension that are covalently bound to the third amino acid of the peptide stem in all cases. That we that we found, and we use different kind of enzymes to show that I will not uh, have no time to go into the details. So it's very different situation uh, in E. coli compared to B. aborans. But if you look carefully to the details, you see that this lysine it's bound to peptidoglycan thanks to an amine group, and we see that that's interesting. So in E. coli, you have here the LPP proteins with the last lysine of the NH2 group, the amine group. And here you have the peptide stem of the peptidoglycan. And you have a, a peptidic linkage here. And this peptidic linkage will be attacked by LG transpeptidase. The last alanine will be removed. And you will have a, a covalent bond here. And this covalent bond will be attacked by the amine to make the covalent bond between the lysine and the mesoderm. This is how uh, LPP is attached to uh, peptidoglycan, thanks to these enzymes that are called LD transpeptidase. And there are three different enzymes in E. coli that can do that. What do we have in Brussels laboratories? In Brussels laboratories, we have eight of these enzymes. And interestingly, six of the eight proteins are direct targets of uh, of C theory. Remember, it's involved in envelope and cell division. So uh, our model was the following. We thought that at least one of these LDT could react with the peptide stem and allow the actually the end terminus of the OMP to react with this bond to make a peptidic linkage between alanine and mesodap. So to study that, what we did is that we co-express in E. coli OMP25 from Brussels Arborus and each of the eight LDT genes that we found in the gene. So basically, we have an E. coli strain with two plasmids, and we make a crude extract. And in the crude extract, you find OMP25. And then we purify peptidoglycan with tested that we purify peptidoglycan by labeling LPP, LPP is there all the time, meaning that indeed we purified peptidoglycan with linked proteins. And then um, we uh, tried to detect OMP25 in the preparation of peptidoglycan. And we found that LDT4 is indeed able to bind OMP25 to the peptidoglycan in E. coli. And you see there is also some labeling with LDT1 and LDT2. So apparently three enzymes are able to make the job. Then we 
moved back to 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 Brussels, and we showed that indeed LDT4 is really important to bind a lot of OMP25, but also OMP2B to the peptidoglyc. So the experiments we did is that we uh, prepared crude extract of, uh, of white type cells first. You see, you have GCRA here, it's just, just a control, loading control. And you have here OMP25 and OMP2B. And then we added lysozyme in the preparation of the crude extract. And you see additional bands here. And these additional bands, they actually correspond to, to the proteins that are bound to fragments of the peptidoglyc. Okay? And if you mutate LDT4, you remove the gene, then you, uh, not only you have more of these proteins in the supernatant, there are more free proteins that can be found in the supernatant of the crude extract, but also you see less proteins bound to the peptidoglyc. And if you complement this mutant with LDT4 on the plasmid, probably you produce a little bit more of this LDT4 because you completely reverse the phenotype. You have more proteins bound to the peptidoglyc and you have less protein free uh, in, the, in the extract. And we tested the eight mutants and combinations of mutants to show that LDT4 is really the main actor in, in this. Interestingly, we learned from a colleague in Spain that if you eat Brusella, Brusella is releasing uh, oral membrane fragments. So fragments of the oral membranes that can uh, be removed from the, from the bacteria. And indeed, if you eat the white type at 80 degrees, you see that in the supernatant, you can find you can find OMP25, and OMP25 is a protein that is in the other membrane. So you can use it as a sensor of the release of other membrane fragments. And if you make a mutant for LDT4, you see that at much lower temperature, uh, 50, 60 degrees, you have a, a strong release of other membrane fragments. And this risk is even stronger with the triple mutant strain where we removed LDT1, 2, and 4 uh, genes. And it's complemented. And you see here images we took in Brussels uh, with our colleagues at uh, VUB. And uh, it's cryo EM. And you see that this uh, bacterium here is uh, releasing other membrane fragments. You see here the other membrane that is making kind of bubbles we call blabs. All right, just to finish, we uh, looked at the sequence, the N-terminal sequences of these proteins that we found to be bound to peptidoglycan, and we realized that not only in Brussels, but in many other rhizobiates, the second amino acid um, of the major protein is an aspartate, D. And so what uh, Kerr did in the lab is that he generated a mutant in which he mutated this aspartate to an alanine. And when you do that, not only do you find more of this OMP25 free in the crude extract, but uh, all the bands corresponding to, uh, to proteins retarded by peptidoglycan disappear, showing that indeed this uh, aspartate is very important to bind this protein to peptidoglyc. And if you mutate now the, the second aspartate of both proteins, one P25 and P2B, you lose all the peptidoglyc and um, retarded bands. And you start to see a phenotype that is uh, a strong bubbling at a low temperature. You see here to all these uh, blebs forming on the surface, and you can quantify these blebs, number of blebs per micrometer of diameter, and you see that you have circumference, and you see that you have much more the mutant compared to, to the white. And I will skip this, but we, we've shown that it's exactly the same thing in uh, Acrobacterium demifacins and other rhizobates. So just to conclude, first we showed that uh, Brussels abortive cell cycle is blocked during the first hours of infection. The growth is unipolar, and that's true for peptoglycan LPS, but also actually for OMPs. 
we've shown that CTRA regulates cell cycle progression and or the membrane composition. And we also showed that um, several important uh, beta barriers in the other membrane are bound to peptidoglycan thanks to a conserved enzyme called uh, LD transpeptidase. And with this, I would like to, to thank um, my group, of course. Uh, this is the lab where we work. Uh, thanks to collaborators, Anne Remot and Sander van der Weeren at VUB for the cryo -EM. Uh, for the mass spec, uh, Marc Dieu and Patsy Renard at uh, Unamur. For the Kelly and Free, Boris Moselle in Paris. And for MicroBJ and all the developments that Adrien made for us, Adrien Ducré uh, in Lyon, and the funding agencies. And I uh, thank you for your attention. I'm sorry, I've been a little bit longer than expected. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Xavier, for this great lecture with a lot of details into the inside of this. Um, yes, we have some minutes. Maybe I would just like uh, also to ask a short question and then, of course, the, the, the other participants can ask. Uh, so there was in, in China also probably a lot of you followed this also um, an outbreak of uh, this in, in the population and it was saying also it was coming from a laboratory. Now seeing your results also um, on the fluorescence imaging where you check for the cell cycle, I was just wondering how you do this. Is it still infectious also, to, I mean, to, res to protect your researchers? Or do you have the fluorescence microscope into the, the biosafety lab? Or how, how is it organized okay. with the imaging of, the, of, of yeah. this? Uh... That's an important question. Actually, uh, we have two micro microscopes in the beer frame. Okay. Uh, one uh, straight, uh, normal uh, epifluorescence microscope and in an inverted microscope. And this, um, we can follow the, the bacteria, uh, the living bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, it's not a lot of bacteria, and we take precautions, of course, to avoid uh, researchers to be infected. Um, yes. <laughs> but uh, we are very lucky to have these uh, these two microscopes in the BCL free, and there are okay. not many labs actually uh, BCL free labs that are equipped like that. And something we'd like to develop in the future is to follow the, the, the infections of cells in time-lapse microscopy. Uh, currently, we can follow um, bacteria growing under the microscope using time-lapse microscopy, and that's, that's already very, very interesting. But in future, we would like to, to, uh, to expand this a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, good to know that they are in, inside the biosafety lab. Um, maybe I can also ask the audience if there are other questions from the audience, then we can unmute uh, your microphones to to ask <laughs> questions. So there haven't been any listed. Uh, also, if you don't want to uh, post or, or if you don't want to ask a question yourself, feel free to post it in the, in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Yes, this also then to the audience. Exactly. Yes. So I, I think the, 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 that this is a, a very particular topic that uh, uh, quite a few of the of the audience will not be so how should I say entrenched in because this is really going into a very, very fine detail and very mechanistic study, which is very, very impressive, in my opinion. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, to do these kind of in-depth studies, because nowadays you have a lot of studies that are very general, uh, very well, high throughput, and, and getting to this level of resolution is, is of course impossible with these studies. So um, how, how, uh, that's a question for me to you, Xavier. Um, how do you think, uh, how should I say, the, the high throughput techniques, could they support this kind of research? Or do you think it is, it is something which needs very specific targeted approaches instead? Okay, so actually we made quite a few of these uh, high throughput approach, like TNSeq, for example. We use a lot TNSeq. I didn't, Say a word about it because uh, uh, I choose the, the topics today, but we use them as well and we find them extremely useful 
to solve uh, targeted questions. Mm -hmm. Because targeted questions, you know, it's living cells and everything is connected to everything. And so um, um, we have, uh, for example, map all the essential genes uh, of Bristol and bonus, thanks to TNC. And if you want to study a division at some point, uh, it's targets of CTRA. We, we make ChIP-seq, we found uh, 100 targets, but thanks to TNC, we can identify the targets that are essential, right? Mm -hmm. And so you expect that uh, proteins necessary for cell division or growth to be essential. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, these um, uh, approaches are certainly not uh, contradictory. I think they are complementary, they should work together. And uh, they are less, um, let's say, uh, easy to present during a seminar because you want to learn how, how the living bacteria uh, work uh, and not necessarily the last technique we you use to, uh, to have just one piece of information. And so uh, I didn't present them, but actually they are, they are very useful for everyday life. Um, but still, we have, a, we have still a lot to, to learn about, about them. I don't know if, if, if I can answer to your questions. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Yannick Schwarz uh, just uh, wrote, thank you very much for this clear and very interesting presentation of your researches about Brucella abortus. Thank you. Um, very specific. Yes, I'm sorry. Was there someone else asking a question or not for the moment? I can't see anything in the chat. Okay. The well, then I think it was uh, quite explicit also on um, what we, we learned today. Um, maybe if you just want to have a, 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 f a final word um, also to, to give your um, opinion about brucellosis in general, how it, it is uh, for, for the moment the situation and maybe with this then we could conclude the 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 presentation and um, and yeah. I would like to thank again uh, Xavier for taking his time um, also to give this uh, this presentation and for all of the rest that you participated is that fine for you Christian uh, Cedric sorry yeah sure sure I mean sure. okay well then the stage is again yours Xavier and thank you very much okay so just to finish I would like to finish with this uh, news from the, from China that uh, actually uh, they prepare uh, vaccine strains, they cultivate Brasilia, and they have to use um, uh, disinfectant, disinfectant to, to, uh, to kill the bacteria. And they actually used uh, stocks that were uh, not any more uh, functional, let's say. And in that particular city, they infected more than 3,000 people only by aerosols. So it tells you that this bacterium uh, is extremely infectious, right? Exactly. Uh, the, the problem is that um, um, you can be infected by a very low amount of, uh, of bacteria. And it also shows that uh, there's another problem in the field is that many of the the Brussels strains, uh, the few Brussels strains uh, that are used as vaccine, they generate problems. At least uh, two of them, they, um, they are still virulent for humans. So meaning you can, uh, uh, you can uh, vaccinate uh, animals, but if humans are infected, they, they will be sick. Uh, that's that's uh, one thing. And the other thing is that uh, these, the same strains, they are resistant to antibiotics that we use in the human treatment. So imagine we make a vaccine that is still pathogenic for, pathogenic for humans and it's resistant to antibiotics. 
so uh, I think uh, it's still a lot for improvement uh, for the vaccine strains. And I think this is really the, the path that some labs in the Priscilla field is uh, following. There is uh, money that comes from the uh, Gates Foundation to help to, uh, to discover and to, uh, to sell a new vaccine for mm -hmm. Brazil. And yeah. uh, I think it's, it's an important yeah. outcome of the future research. Not yes. much, of course, but uh, in the field. So also there is really a, a necessity to, to learn the whole cell division and uh, <laughs> mechanisms of, of how Brazil works. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much, Xavier, and thank you to all. Then I would say bye bye. <laughs> see you. Uh, see you at the next uh, lecture where we will still confirm the dates. Um, when it will exactly take place, you will get information by email about about this. Okay. Thank you very much, and bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.